if I could go back in time and say to myself, guess what? In X amount of years, you're going to be on Star Trek. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't believe it. It's an unimaginable dream, and it's just been such an honor to be, I don't even want to say franchise. I mean, again, I'll use the word family. To be part of the Star Trek family is, is such an honor. Hi, I'm Leslie Hoffman. I've been a stunt woman on Star Trek Deep Space Nine and Voyager, and you're listening to me on Trek Untold. to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I am your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. I love speaking with stunt performers, and this week is special because I'm talking to a guest who rarely does interviews. Her name is Leslie Hoffman, and she's performed stunts on Deep Space Nine and on Voyager, including being Roxanne Dawson's stunt double. She was also one of the only female stunt coordinators in Star Trek history, and her storied career includes crossing paths with other Trek luminaries like Ricardo Montalban. Horror movie fans know her from her role in the original Wes Craven Nightmare on Elm Street film, and you've seen her also in many things, even though you probably actually haven't seen her because she's a stunt person, they gotta hide their faces, but you've seen her in a ton of other things, including Chips, Falcon Crest, The A-Team, Melrose Place, Step by Step, Scream 2, Alien Nation, Clue, Laverne and Shirley, and she was even a stunt granny in the Mystery Men film. Best of all though, she's a legit true Trekkie who got to live her dreams, and to me, that's always one of my favorite stories to hear on this podcast. So get ready to meet a lady who's nobody's fall guy, unless they paid her the big bucks to jump out a window safely onto a crash pad, and let's begin our chat with Leslie Hoffman. But before we get into this week's episode, I have to ask you, are you following Trek Untold on social media yet? You can find us over on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, all at Trek Untold, one word with no spaces. You can also become a Patreon supporter for this podcast over at patreon.com slash trekuntold. Here, you can directly contribute to keeping this show running at full power for as low as a few bucks a month. If you do this, you'll have early access to new episodes, the ability to ask future guests questions, check out exclusive merchandise, and other special benefits. We've also got an official merch store and an Amazon store filled with Star Trek goodies. So if you want to rock a Trek Untold t-shirt to the next con you're going to, or order something Star Trek related for yourself or someone else, please use the links in the show notes to help us help you. Shout out to our show sponsor, Triple Fiction Productions, makers of fine 3D printed Star Trek inspired toys and accessories for collectors of all kinds. But you'll hear more about them later on. Now without further ado, let's beam up this week's guest. Computer, access interview file. She's fallen downstairs, been set on fire, punched Klingons, and today she's about to suffer more than ever as she joins us on this show. Leslie Hoffman, welcome to Trek Untold. Oh, glad to be here. I'm really excited today to talk to you about your time in Star Trek, some of the cool stuff that you've done in the world of stunts. we got a lot to go through here, not just the Trek, but definitely well beyond it. Uh, but I want to start at the very beginning in the same way I start with all my guests here. So, uh, Leslie, can you tell me what's your earliest memory of Star Trek? Were you a fan of the series when you were growing up? Were you a fan of the series when you were growing up? Well, I'm old enough that... Um... I'm an original Trekker. Uh, I may not have been old enough to watch it the the first time that it was on television, but I definitely saw it, you know, when it repeated. So I, uh, you know, 60s, early 70s. All right. So, Leslie, I want to get a little bit of your secret origin story right now. Uh, can you tell me where you grew up, who your parents were, and what little Leslie wanted to be when she grew up? Okay, I was born in Saranac Lake, New York, which is 300 miles directly north of New York City. I am 
two hours away from Montreal. I am close. I'm one hour away from the Canadian border. I I, I mean, I'm almost in Canada. Uh, um, my father was a pharmacist. My mother was a housekeeper. I mean, we we lived in a town. There's five thousand. Um, and as for um. I always knew that I wanted to be an actress. Uh, growing up, when the teachers made you write the, uh, you know, what I want to be when I grow up, I, it was always acting. <laughs> or I'll say, and I'll change it to entertainment, but we'll get into that later. <laughs> so when did you discover acting and actually start doing it? <laughs> I was pigeon-toed. So my mother was told that I should take ballet lessons that would turn my feet out, which sort of led into uh, being on the stage in front of people. And also, um, I don't know, I might have been five or six years old. Uh, I was in uh, one of the summer theater plays. So like you say, I've always I've always been on the stage. It's it, it's never changed. Well, along the way, you transitioned from acting into the world of stunts. So how did that happen? I believe it was it was either the summer between 11th and 12th grade or or right after I graduated. Uh, well, actually, two things is that I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. And in all honesty, I found acting boring. I mean, the teachers I had, it was take two steps here, say your line, take 10 steps there, say your line. I mean, that that isn't what I wanted. That isn't what I wanted out of uh, being, well, now, I'll, like you say, I'll change it to an entertainer <laughs> as opposed to acting. Um, I... Um, my older brother actually went to Caltech and we went out to visit him and we went to the Universal uh well studio tour and when and in it was the Western stunt show. Mm. And here were these guys jumping off roofs, uh punching each other, rolling on the ground. And yet they were still saying their lines. They were still acting. <laughs> and and that's when I said, that's what I want to be. I want to be a stunt woman. <laughs> and so uh, once I graduated high school, uh, I went out to California and and pursued getting into stunt work. So how did you end up getting trained to do stunts? Uh, I discovered that there was a gym in Santa Monica. It actually was a boxing gym, but this stunt man rented it on Saturday and and he would teach or well, I'll say he would teach uh, stunt people or would be stunt people how to do stunts. In reality, we actually taught each other. Uh, when I was at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, I was taught fencing. So I would teach people how to fence. And in return, they would teach me how to do a high fall or a fight or, you know, it was it was a trade off. We we learned from each other. So you've worked on many, many different projects. And I want to just talk about a few of those before we start getting into Trek. Um, you worked on a Leslie Nielsen film. And I love hearing stories about him. But what can you tell me about your contributions to his movie and what it was like to work with him? It was really amazing. I mean, first of all, uh, well, we actually spell our name exactly the same, L-E-S-L-I-E. -E. <laughs> well, first, first I have to, rule number one that I made for myself was I would never go up to an actor and introduce myself because you don't know if you're going to interrupt them or they 
you know, you you give them space. If they if they start talking to you, then it's all right to talk to them. Anyways, so back to Naked Gun set is that um, all day long, you know, they're saying Leslie to the set and they meant Leslie Nielsen. Uh, and finally, they got to my stunt and they said, Leslie to the set. And Leslie comes up to me and he goes, Leslie, that's a nice sounding name. And I could not think of a snappy comeback. And I all I could say is, I think so, Leslie. And <laughs> I mean, he was and he really did have this mini whoopee cushion. Uh, he would stand next to somebody and and make that farting sound. <laughs> <laughs> he is infamous yeah, for that fart machine. He, he was he was fun to work with. You also worked with a big time Trek alumni, and that's Ricardo Montalban uh, in Fantasy Island and in the Naked Gun movie. What was Ricardo like in real life? He he was so wonderful. He was a gentleman. I first worked with him on Fantasy Island on a couple of episodes, not necessarily in the same scene. But we were on the set together, and again, he was someone who would talk to you first, and 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 it became a point that I mean, I felt I could say hello to him. Uh, I mean, obviously, you don't interrupt him, but <laughs> uh, uh, such a gentleman. I mean, he, and then and then I didn't know he was working on Naked Gun. And I walk on the set and he walks up to me and he says, hello, Leslie. I mean, it was a couple of years. It had to have been a couple of years <laughs> later. And this movie star, I mean, people don't realize that he was a movie star. He was he was a ladies man in the 40s and 50s movies. Um, and he remembered my name. I mean, just I I I can't say enough good about Ricardo. He was he was just an awesome person to be around. Now my girlfriend is a massive Nightmare on Elm Street fan, and Leslie, when I mentioned your name, she didn't think about Star Trek first. She thought of that movie, uh, and I know a lot of folks remember you best from your time on screen in that film. So talk to me about your time on that set and what you did on Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, I played the hall monitor. Um, the whole point of Nightmare on Elm Street was uh, people would fall asleep and Freddy would show up and either kill you or scare you. And uh, so the scene I was in was the the lead, the heroine, Nancy, falls asleep in her classroom and then she sees her her dead friend Tina and she runs out of the room and runs down the hallway turns the corner and she runs into the hall monitor which was play actually played by me a lot of times um you stunt double an actress but but this was like a low 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 budget film the first the first film was really no money and it was cheaper to hire me as an actress and have me fall to the floor, you know, do the stunt, have me fall to the floor. But so, I mean, it's it's not even 30 seconds long, but it's like she knocks me to the ground and I go, where's your pass? And she goes, screw your pass. And then and then you see me. I'm wearing Freddie's sweater and I have his claws on in the yeah. last scene. And um, and so then there's a, a single shot of me waving the claws saying, hey, Nancy, no running in the hallway. Now, Wes Craven, now talk about directors. I think Wes Craven was one of the nicest directors that I worked for. Mm -hmm. uh, he came up to me and he said, Leslie, I need you to say, Hey, Nancy, no running in the hallway, but I'm telling you now, your voice is not going to make it to the screen because we're going to have the actor dub in his voice. You know, it was like he was apologizing to me, like like he was taking away something 
dear to me. I don't know what to call it. I mean, I'm a stun woman. I'm yes, I talk once in a while, but but to be told that that my voice isn't going to make it to the screen is like, eh. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. Uh, when people see me, that they'll either they'll say one of those three lines. You know, where's your pass? Screw your pass. Hey, Nancy, no running in the hallway. I mean that. And even today, I get I have people say that to me. That's that's how memorable uh, that scene is. And and I also have people say that that. Um, that scene just absolutely scared them. And I, I never thought about that scene being that scary, but but I guess it was. I mean, uh, I guess, especially for a younger person, to ha have somebody else's voice come out of this unknown person's mouth just was totally unnerving. I can confirm that nearly 40 years later, it is very unnerving. Oh yeah, no, it's 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 really it's really amazing. I mean, I am a true Trekkie. I love Star Trek, but but I think because because you don't necessarily know where I am in an Star Trek episode, the horror fans definitely see me, see my face, you know, and 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 they they still recognize me. Do you remember the very first professional stunt job that you ever did? It was a movie called Two Minute Warning. Um, for some reason, I mean, it still happens today. For some reason, one studio will make a movie with a storyline and another studio will make basically the same movie with a different title. I was in Two Minute Warning. It is almost the same as black sunday <laughs> it's it's a panic crowd running through a football stadium and um because they were supposedly filming different hallways they had to change stunt people like every three days and um and the stunt coordinator ran out of stunt women uh, there's actually a story. Well, now, now you've asked for it. There's actually a story that goes with this. So naive me, I was told to go to the producer and ask him for a letter that I could join the Screen Actors Guild. And I called up and the secretary said, sure, give me your name, your address, you know, social, I'll, uh, I said, when can I have this letter? She said, you could come by. I forget if she said today or tomorrow. And and I did it. And and I never even thought twice about it until several years later, I bumped into this other stunt woman who said, you, you got in the guild on my coattails. It turns out that she had somebody at Universal Studio who knew the producer, who knew she wanted a card, and he was going to give her the letter. And the secretary thought that I was that girl. And that's why I got the, you You can't call up a producer and just ask for a letter. Doesn't happen that way. <laughs> but because the secretary didn't know that I wasn't the other woman, she just she just wrote the letter and the producer signed it and I got in the guild. I mean, the other woman got into the guild too. I mean, they so so it wasn't like she lost out, but but she was very angry. That's a Hollywood <laughs> story right there. <laughs> Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is sponsored by Triple Fiction Productions. Celebrating 15 years in business in 2023, 
TFP creates 3D printed Star Trek and sci-fi inspired items that fit into any collection. Whether you're a cosplayer who wants a Starfleet phaser, Bajoran tricorder, or a Klingon dagger, or a toy collector looking for that special accessory or diorama to make your figures truly stand out, Triple Fiction Productions has exactly what you need. And for you figure fanatics, that includes products that are the perfect size for Galoob, Mego, Playmates, and everything in between. All products are 3D printed in the US, with new designs constantly being updated on their website. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free, where the more you order, the more discounts you receive. TFP also has a pay what you want section, where clearance or misprinted items are available at a discounted price. Best of all, every product can be shipped worldwide. As a special bonus for listeners of this show, Trek Untold has a special discount code just for you. Enter UNTOLD10 at checkout for 10% off of all orders with no minimum purchase required. That's 10% off using UNTOLD10. To see all of their products, head to triple-fictionproductions.net. Or to stay up to date on their newest products, find them on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Triple Fiction Productions, where something is only impossible until it happens. Are you looking for the perfect fashion statement to show you're a geek and proud of it? Well, welcome to Geek Girls Castle, where I make fun and functional geeky clothing and accessories for every occasion. My name is Missy, and I started creating my own gear and apparel in 2015 to bring nerdy products to the geek girl population, which does include all LGBTQA+, non-binary, and POC and BIPOC folks. I couldn't find anything for us gals except t-shirts, so I decided to combine my passion for fashion with my fandoms, ranging from handmade skirts with really large pockets, travel accessories like toiletry bags, luggage tags, and zippered pouches. I also embroider nerdy items for home decor like wall hangings and hand towels, and products like keychains, bookmarks, and journal covers. Need something to carry all that in? Well, I make great bags to put all those accessories into or onto. Whether you like Star Trek, Star Wars, Doctor Who, Marvel, DC, and everything else in between, there is something for every geek girl. My website is constantly updated with new styles and fandoms, no matter what time or dimension you come from. If you'd like to browse my products or ask for something custom, visit me at geekgirlscastle.com. That's geekgirlscastle.com. All right, Leslie, let's beam into our Star Trek talk now. And that starts for you as a stunt performer on Deep Space Nine. How did you land the gig? And what did you do that very first time? Well, now we got to go back to the gym. Is Dennis Madalone was one of the would-be stunt people like Tom Morga. I don't know all the people you've uh, uh, interviewed, but I mean... There's there as Dennis would call it. There's there's a whole family that we all practice together. We all dream together. We did live stunt shows together. Fortunately, unfortunately, I got married and went back to New York during the next generation. Marriage didn't work out. I came back to California. Deep Space Nine had already started and I got in touch with Dennis and Dennis knows my background from the gym and like I say we're family and he hired me because he knew that I could do stunts now the the first one really was it it was uh uh-oh let's see I think it was called way of the warrior it's the one that introduced war in into deep space nine that's the one oh okay so so it was uh it was what what should i call it it was the mass attack where the klingons kept coming into the into the deep space nine and you know it it was just uh, this is what you call nondescript. In other words, I was i wasn't doubling anybody. I just was part of the stunt crowd getting shot at, you know, and that, and that was really the first stunt that I did for Deep Space Nine. But I got to tell you is I worked at Paramount on other movies like Clue and, and well, I, I'd, I'd have to look at who, which, which movies were done at Paramount. But Well, uh, let me go back for a moment. I actually went to the second New York City 
a Star Trek convention. <laughs> I mean, I took a bus and went down to New York City. That, that's how much of a Trekkie I am. That's commitment, I, especially from upstate New York. I'm not afraid to say Trekkie as opposed to Trekker. <laughs> So you know mm -hmm. the difference. That's how I know you're legit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you that that first day that I walked on Paramount, knowing that I was going to be on Star Trek as opposed to any other job that I've done at Paramount, it was it was like being the first first day. It was going back to being the first day of being a stunt woman. I mean, I. To be part of a history, to to tell to tell my younger self watching Star Trek, the original Star Trek, or, or what was called Star Trek, they didn't call it TOS. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I could go back in time and say to myself, "Guess what? In X amount of years, you're going to be on Star Trek," <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't believe it. I mean. It's 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 an unimaginable dream and 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 it's just been such an honor to be part of I don't even want to say franchise. I mean again I'll use the word family. To be part of the Star Trek family is is such an honor. Well, let's talk about family. Uh, Dennis Matt alone was the coordinator for most of Star Trek in that era, working with Tom Morga both of whom we had on this show a while back, uh, as well as others too. So tell me a little bit more about this family of folks that you worked with and how you all got along on set. Well, again, um, now I'm trying to remember. Uh, Paul Stater's Jim, you had Chris Doyle, you had um, uh, Mike Cassidy, you had John Nowak. I mean, Dennis is very family oriented not only blood relatives because he has used his wife he has used his brother-in-law he's used high school buddies mark ricardi uh irving lewis and and he combined the two families together i mean so whether whether it was due to the gym or whether it was due to actual family we were all big, one big family. So we were a family within a family. We were we were the stunt family within the Star Trek family. And again, we because we worked out together at the gym, we we knew our skills. We knew what we were capable of. So across the many episodes you did of Deep Space Nine, what were some of the most memorable stunts you remember performing? Well, <laughs> the memorable one was doubling uh, Vedic Yasum in uh, Rocks and Shoal, where where she hung herself. It was it was kind of interesting. As I was walking to the set, I met David Livingston walking in the other direction, and and I said to him, "I can't believe that I'm committing suicide because that seems so anti Star Trek." And he actually agreed with me. I mean, again. I'm talking to to a producer, you know, and and I mean that that that's just the way we could do it. Whether whether you're a security guard or whether you're a producer or a stunt person or an actor, um, we could again, you respect their space, but but we all talk together. So I had to commit suicide, and. The way they did it was the the same way they did Tom Morga's stunt in Schism, hmm. uh, where Riker floats off the table and floats through the, the ship. But I'm committing suicide, so I'm coming down this way. But it, it was filmed in slow motion. So the camera, the camera goes faster to to make the scene slower so so you hear the camera go like that um and then you you know you hear and action you know camera and action and uh one of the times that i did the jump 
I hear the camera going, and I hear action, and I step off the balcony, and all of a sudden there's dead silence. The, the camera jammed. <laughs> and it isn't like, uh, it isn't like cartoons. It isn't like you can step back on, on the second story of, of the promenade. I mean, you're going down. <laughs> you stepped off and you're going down. Um, so, um, I mean, that was memorable. Another thing, <laughs> this is kind of embarrassing. That's the kind of stories we love to hear. Oh, okay. Is before I did the stunt, I, I was wearing a harness as well. Well, for a different part of the stunt. But um, I told Lillian Chavez that I I have to go to the bath. You know, I want to go to the bathroom before I get put in this harness. Because once I'm in the harness, it's going to take a lot longer to get out of it. <laughs> and, and Lillian... Maybe not at the top of her voice, but loud enough that everyone on the set could hear, Leslie is going to the bathroom, or Leslie's going in the, going to be in the bathroom for a while. <laughs> that's pretty <laughs> embarrassing. Yeah, that's uh, you don't need to, you don't need that announced. <laughs> you know, I was just <laughs> telling Lillian where I was going to be in case. Someone might ask where I was going or where Leslie was. I mean, also, uh, the padding for both Tom and I, when we're talking years different, we're talking TNG to DS9. Uh, you first have the porter pit, which is sort of like what um pole vaulters jump into or fall into, but then you put cardboard boxes on top of that because if you were to do a straight leg jump usually when you do a high fall you land on your back uh when you do a straight leg jump into a porter pit what the boxes do is it, it kind of captures your legs and slows you down and you you almost end up in a sitting position in the boxes if you were to jump straight leg into a porter pit, there's a good chance you're going to run your knees into your face. Hmm. So, so like you say, uh, other than vertical and horizontal, for Tom being vertical and or no, I'm sorry, for Tom being horizontal, they turn they turn the camera sideways. And and I was vertical. I mean, I was doing a fall because I was hanging myself. It's the exact same stunt. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. Now, uh, how often were you in alien makeup for these? And did that make those jobs more difficult? Yes. Um, boy, that's hard to say. I, I would have to go through every uh, episode I was in. I mean, I've been... Uh, a Romulan as Torres, um, um, half Klingon. Uh, well, this was another quick funny story. In Memorial, the uh, character was called a Nakin. And I said, I'm going to be naked? <laughs> <laughs> no, Nakin. <laughs> um, it can take an hour and a half. Um, to three plus four plus hours to put the makeup on and an hour and a half easily to take the makeup off because they're trying to save the prosthetics that they don't have to make new ones. So so they use like the the tiny little paintbrush with the solvent to, you know, well, they they tack the the forehead on. And, you know, so they kind of lift up the piece and and just kind of tack or, mm. or, or brush the solvent in and try to save the piece. I was a Cardassian. Now, that that took three hours plus because I believe there are nine pieces all together. I got I forget. There's like the forehead, the nose, uh, there's the side pieces, there's the neck. Um 
So, that, so that's long makeup. Hey everybody, we'll get right back to the interview in one second, but I wanted to remind you all to check out Trek Untold over at Patreon. Patreon is the best way to directly support creators of things you like through a monthly subscription of an amount that you can choose. Trek Untold has a few different tiers already with different benefits, ranging from early access to episodes, the ability to ask a future guest questions, exclusive merchandise, and other bonuses that I'd love to offer, but first I need to grow that Patreon community to do that. Trek Untold has been around since mid-2020 and has grown a ton since then, thanks to listeners and viewers like you. Through a platform like Patreon, you can help me keep improving the quality of each episode and keep bringing you new interviews with folks that make the Star Trek universe what it is. If this community can grow more over on Patreon, I can offer new perks like watch parties, exclusive Trek Untold episodes, being able to directly interact with guests, and other things, but in order to do that, I need to know my audience wants these things. The best way to tell me what you want is by supporting us on Patreon, so please, Check us out at patreon.com slash trekuntold today and become a bigger part of the Trek Untold family. And now, back to the interview. Eventually, you started to do work on Voyager, where you doubled for Roxanne Dawson. So yeah. what was she like to work with? I'll say she was quiet. I mean, um, she she wasn't a big talker. Um, I mean, she wasn't she wasn't mean or anything. She just was... Uh, kind of a to her person or to herself, but but never never any problems. In Star Trek and beyond, uh, can you tell me some of the other folks that you doubled for and some of the stunts that you would do for them? Well, I used to double Doris Roberts on Remington Steel, who was Mildred, and I had to walk across uh, a ledge four stories up in downtown L.A. I mean that that was really dangerous. Uh I've doubled Tova Feldshun. Uh, also on Remington Steel, I doubled Rosemary. Now she was very talkative. Um uh, uh maybe because she was a guest star and she didn't really know the other actors on the set. And for some reason she she started showing me pictures of her grandchildren and I mean it was a really pleasant day. Well, here's another story is that Pierce and I would talk again if he talked to me first. Uh, what I didn't realize is that his calls were earlier than mine. So by the time he saw me, I was in a blonde wig. I was Mildred or dressed up as Mildred. Well, one day my call was earlier than his. And I'm walking on to the set and I see Pierce and I say, hi, Pierce. And he kind of goes mm -hmm, like that. And I'm going, what did I do wrong? I mean, or is he in a bad mood or, you know, I, I couldn't imagine what happened. And then later I'm in makeup and Pierce comes up to me and he goes, I am so sorry, Leslie. I thought you were blonde. <laughs> no, but he's, he was really nice. If you can name names of the people that you've doubled, who was most appreciative and welcoming and who was the least appealing to work with? That's hard to say. Um, it, it wasn't necessarily the actresses, uh, that were friendly or unfriendly or um i mean actually i found that the actors were much more talkative and much more friendly uh avery on um, deep space nine was was talkative uh one day uh now i do forget the name of this this episode but where where he was dressed up as a klingon where they were infiltrating i hear this voice say to me hi leslie and usually with the stunt people i can see through the makeup and see who i'm talking to you know if it's tom or dennis or i mean i can see they they may be Cardassians, they may be Jemadars, uh, whatever, but I can see who they are. But I turn around and it's this Klingon saying hello to me. And I'm looking at this. I, I had absolutely no idea who this person was. 
it turned out that it was Avery and he was <laughs> he was probably doing it to almost everybody on the set but it, I mean I, I because I didn't know about the script or the storyline um <laughs> it just was really funny to have Avery as a Klingon say hello to me and again I was totally clueless so what were some of the stunts that you did on Roxanne Dawson's behalf? And what was your favorite or most memorable? Actually, the one I'm I'm most proud of was a uh, day of honor because Roxanne was either nine or 10 weeks pregnant and they didn't want her doing any stunts at all. They didn't even want to intercut her at all in in the stunt fight that we did. So when you see the Klingon do the last pain stick to the supposed Torres, that's actually me. And the whole, well, the stunt man, uh, excuse me, the cameraman was wearing something called a steady cam. So he's able to walk around with this camera and, and without cutting, they're able to film the whole fight. And I was fighting Tom Morga. Um, and uh, like I say, they they filmed the, the whole fight. And I knocked Tom to the ground. And the camera pans down to Tom. But then I step out of the picture. Well, you don't see it on camera. Is that while they're looking at Tom... I step out of the picture, Roxanne steps in, the camera swings to Roxanne, and she says something like, you know, I don't want to do this, uh, I'm leaving. And so th there is no cut in this film. I mean, you you watch most stunt fights, like uh, in Blood Fever, um, there was a fight uh, between... Uh, Vorek, the Vulcan, and Roxanne, and and you can well for me, you can see where it's me, and then you see where it's her, and you know you can see it go back and forth. Like you say, I I'm most proud of the not a single cut fight in a uh, Day of Honor. Also, another thing about Day of Honor was um. Uh, the director, well, Tom and I worked out the fight, and there's a flip he does where he flips me to my stomach as opposed to my back. And <laughs> the director comes over, and we do the fight for him, and he, he's impressed with the fight. But then Tom says, well, I could do this, and he flips me to my back. He, he says, or I could do this, and he flips me to my stomach, or I could do this, and I forget how he flipped me. And and the director said, well, I think I like number two. And Tom goes, oh, you mean this? And he flips me to my stomach. I hope you got Tom back for that one. Yeah, that, that was really funny. Actually, we did film the fight three times, and and... I forget if you've already asked this or or this was a question that's coming up um, is the makeup is the first time we did the fight, Tom had this really long hair Klingon wig on and I knock him to the ground and I'm waiting for him to stand up so I can do the next punch. And what happened is he's kneeling on his hair. He can't, he can't get up. So so they yelled cut and okay so take two, um, he knocks me to the ground and he comes at me with those big Klingon boots or you know he's just stepping towards me but but he just kicked a bunch of dirt into my face. I mean my mouth was full of dirt. It was in my eyes. It was all. Um, even though they powder down the makeup, it's still very sticky. Your your wig will stick, you know, your wig will stick across your face like that. Or, or um, I mean, so I stood up and, and you know, I, I asked for like 
uh, an empty cup and a cup of water. And I mean, I'm just spitting out dirt out of my mouth. I'm taking swigs of water and spitting out dirt out of my mouth. And the makeup person, you know, is is cleaning up my face. But then the third time we did it perfectly and there was no problem with that. And that does sound very bad. But what was the roughest stunt that you did in Star Trek overall? The roughest stunt was um, I always get the name of the documentary mixed up with the name of the episode. What we leave behind or what you leave behind. Um, The DS9 finale. When I was doubling Mila and she was a dead body and she's thrown down the staircase by the Jemadars. So I can't adjust for the stair fall. Also, originally, the staircase, I think, was supposed to be metal. But Dennis, who's an excellent stunt coordinator, I mean, he fought for the staircase to have padding under a carpet and less banners going down the staircase that I won't accidentally hit my head on on a banner. And uh, we shot it once. We got it the first time. and and. That's that's what you need in a stunt coordinator is someone that's going to look out for you. Nothing to do with Dennis. The funny thing is, is that so then this bomb, this little ball or bomb comes down the steps and explodes. And again, I'm a dead body. And this you can see this little spark of fire come and land maybe a foot away from my hand. I mean, luckily, it didn't land on my hand, but. I mean, I'm laying there dead and I can just feel the heat of that that spark near my hand. I'm just, you know, please, yo, cut. And looking at your entire career of stunts, Leslie, what was the most dangerous stunt that you ever did? The most dangerous stunt was on a movie called 1941. It was a Spielberg film. Um it was when the motorcycle sidecar split and the sidecar went up the loading dock and it was supposed to go up this ramp and jump into the back of an egg truck or steak bed truck that had eggs in it. Um, what happened was the mechanics put the gas line across the the struts, the metal struts that the seat was sitting on. And so we would... We would make it up onto the loading dock. We would almost make it to the ramp and we'd run out of gas. Um, And we did this several times and we kept, well, you know, uh, David Cassidy, who's someone from Stater's Gym, the minute he got out of the the sidecar, um, you know, the gas would would fill up in the line and and the sidecar would start again. Um, and last time of that particular night, he decided that we were going to jump and we ran out of gas just as we were coming off the ramp and the back, the, the sidecar hit the back of the egg truck. He flipped over and went to the ground. They had pads on the ground for him. I mean, so he wasn't hurt. Um, I slid onto the truck. I mean, so I guess I was okay that way. But had we hit any lower, I would have been decapitated. I mean, I would have hit the back of the truck. So I would say that was the most dangerous stunt that that I ever did. Uh, the next, and then they call us back the next night because they still don't have the shot. But luckily, they figured out what they had done wrong. And they put the gas line underneath the struts. So, you know, I mean, we did it once the second night and we, you know, powered on right into the tr- back of the truck. No problem. And since I mentioned it in my intro, uh, you were, in fact, set on fire. How many times have you done that and what's it like? And I know that there's safety protocols involved and it's not like that, but it must still feel just very, very frightening to be set on fire. Strangely enough, I would sooner get set on fire than be in water, which is strange. Coming from Saranac Lake, what isn't trees (laughs) is lakes. 
So you would think that I wouldn't be afraid of water, but I am afraid. Uh, well, it isn't that I would. I mean, I've done a lot of water stunts, but but I'm more concerned about drowning than I am about fire. I built my own fire suit. So I have done a full burn, but never for a movie or television show. Uh, there was a movie made for TV called Hounds of Hell, where my arm was set on fire. And again, you you depend on your crew. I mean that that's the thing. I mean, once you're on fire, you're on. It isn't. It isn't like you can put yourself out. So I had a very good crew, and and they knew that I was going to, you know, turn around or scream and turn around so many times, and 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 they put my arm out, and and that wasn't a problem. There there was uh, another um, movie called Nellie Bly, and she was the famous, like she was the first woman reporter. Now, I wasn't on fire, but we were running through a factory that was on fire. And there was a stunt woman ahead of me, an actress in the middle, and then myself. And as we're running through this burning factory, the actress slips and falls to the ground. Now, instead of stopping the cameras or anything like that, all I did was bend down, pick her up, and then just kind of hugged hugged her and ran and we finished the shot so again you not only do you have to protect yourself you have to protect others and you've done it all in this industry and the way you talk about it it sounds like you take it in stride but this really is a job where one wrong move could end your life so how did you balance doing a job like this versus making sure you wake up the next day the bottom line is you never take a stunt you can't do. I mean, I, I've been asked to ride a motorcycle and lie it down, you know, slide it down. And I I don't ride motorcycles. So so you thank people very much for for offering the job to you. But but I'm not a daredevil. Daredevil does a stunt once. And they end up in the hospital for several years. <laughs> you know, they, they've broken every bone. A stunt person has to be able to do a stunt over and over again until the director gets what he wants. One thing I, I, I haven't talked about was um, Dennis had so much faith in me. There were times that Dennis had to be on... Deep Space Nine, Voyager, maybe they had to pick up a shot from a previous episode. There was production meetings to go to. And I was one of Dennis's assistant stunt coordinators. I was actually the only female assistant stunt coordinator for Dennis, which, I, again, I'm very grateful. I mean, uh, back back in the... 80s, 90s, women really weren't given their that chance to do that. And and Dennis, again, knowing knowing my background, he gave me that chance. I mean, you're a veteran of this industry and definitely a pioneer in it as well. So for stunt performers who are just starting out, what's something that they should know before seriously starting to look for work? Um know your craft. I mean, again, don't take a stunt that you can't do. Don't just because someone says, I'll hire you if you jump off this building and you go, oh boy, this is my big break into the business. And yet you don't know how to do a high fall. I mean, that that's why people die in this business. Is that they've taken stunts that they had no business taking, and that's for men and women. So, so it goes back to only take a stunt that you are capable of doing. All right, Leslie, it's time for some real tough questions now. This is the lightning round. Are you ready for some fastballs? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, how about best day on a set and worst day on a set? Best day is an accumulation of every day that I've been on Star Trek. Worst day is um uh, not gonna name the movie, uh, <laughs> but uh a stunt coordinator that was trying to get me hurt. He had taken his people and taught them how to do what's called an air ram. He didn't call me up, but then the director wanted me to do an air ram. And I said, no, I, you know, I was in high heels and, and I said no. And as we learned today, that's always the right thing to do. Right. I mean, I could have broken my ankles. I, just, I love this. This is Isaiah over here. Yeah. <laughs> He's been hanging out the whole interview with us. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Okay. Lightning round. How about the most challenging job that became most rewarding? Hmm. Again, challenging. I'm... Again, it, it, it's such a split. Uh, um, I, I go back to to Mila's dead uh, <laughs> stair falls. I mean, I've done bunches of stair falls. I've done stair falls for Columbo, for uh, Mad Men. I mean, you can put stunts in a category, but depending on the movie, the story, every time you do supposedly the same thing it's it's different uh so so challenging was being like you said a dead body and really not having control to let's say correct yourself if something was going wrong rewarding um i'm putting it in the category of nightmare on elm street that people recognize my face and and i can't tell you how many times i've heard those three lines and and i appreciate it i mean <laughs> so so that 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 was from from a low budget film that you never you never even thought that it would be seen again where it becomes a cult favorite i mean and then and then everybody uh like I say, recognizes you. Also, back to Wes Craven, not only did he give me in the credits a uh, hall monitor or hall guard, Leslie Hoffman, he also gave me a credit under stunts. And I've been in so many, well, television shows, you never get a credit. Uh, movies, you might get a credit. Um, but I mean, here was a movie that I got my name in the credits twice. <laughs> <laughs> How about most memorable piece of advice you ever received from somebody that you still think about today? Well, now we come back to the same thing is never take a stunt that you're not capable of doing. <laughs> that That is the biggest and best advice that was given to me that I'll pass on to anyone else is you you even with a stunt coordinator on the set you gotta you gotta know whether you can do it or not i think we're gonna put that on a t-shirt leslie and we're gonna make some money off that <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> and uh, last question for today what's the best thing about being a part of the star trek universe i i i hate using the word franchise because it sounds like you're talking about money mm -hmm. i would rather use family to be or history to be part of the history uh uh the i believe the last encyclopedia that came out the two the two book encyclopedia by uh michael and denise okuda i i'm not in the book but if you go to the index or whatever's at the back of the book my name is listed there so it's it's being remembered i guess that's it i would say leslie that you're definitely going to be remembered uh not just for star trek but for everything you've contributed to the world of stunts and yeah i just want to add also if you really look at it you know here's 
little girl from Saranac comes down to New York City to go to a Star Trek convention. And then a few decades later, she's in Star Trek. So you live the dream. That's pretty amazing. Yes, it's it's uh, I mean, it was rare back then. Let's say there were uh, well, for acting, there could be 10,000 women trying to get an acting job. For stunt work, there could be a hundred women trying to get a stunt job. Um, it's it's only increased through the years, and where where it was rare during my time to make a living in the business, I was lucky enough to make a living in the business. It's it's become even rarer now. Well, you did it, Leslie, and you got to be on Star Trek. So uh, congratulations, of course. And thank you so much for talking with us today and telling us about all of your awesome stories in the stunt world. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. That's it for this week's show. Thanks again for checking out Trek Untold. If you aren't already, please follow Trek Untold on social media, where you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, among others, all at Trek Untold. Don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube for the video versions of this show at youtube.com slash at Trek Untold. And subscribe to us on whatever platform you're listening to the audio version on. We always appreciate likes, shares, comments, thumbs up, ratings, and reviews, and whatever you can do to help spread the word about this podcast and inform other Trekkies about why they need to check this show out. If you're able to financially support this show, visit patreon.com slash trekuntold to learn about the different ways you can contribute to keeping this show going full speed ahead. Until next time, I'm Matthew Kaplowitz. This has been Trek Untold, and remember, fortune favors the bold. Trek Untold is sponsored by treksphere.com. Promoting fan-produced Star Trek content in all forms is powered by the Rageworks Podcasting Network and is affiliated with Nerd News Today.